Hi and welcome to the Journalism Salute. I'm Mark Simon. In each episode, we'll talk to or about an interesting person or organization related to journalism. The intent is to show that journalists are not the enemy of the people. Thank you for listening. On today's show, we're joined by Dr. Hannah Brown and Anna Hamilton of The Marjorie. The Marjorie is a woman-owned reporting nonprofit that promotes a greater understanding of issues related to women and the environment in Florida through storytelling and community building. Their website is themarjorie.org. Dr. Brown is a journalist, social scientist, and adjunct lecturer of environmental science at the University of Florida. She has a BA in psychology, a master's in journalism, and a doctorate in interdisciplinary ecology. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. We are happy to be here. Anna Hamilton is a PhD student at the University of North Carolina School of American Studies. She's working on an oral history project documenting the stories of life along Florida's Matanzas River. Welcome to the podcast, Anna. Thank you so much for having me. All right. So this is Women's History Month, and I think a history lesson is in order right at the start. Can you explain how you connected and why this project is called The Marjorie? Hannah and I met in college, and Hannah and our third colleague who couldn't be here, Becca Burton, they met in a master's program, and we had worked on a project together, and when that project ended nearly three years ago, out of the whole project team, we found that the three of us really vibed well and had a lot of overlapping interests and skill sets and wanted to find a path forward in working together. We all have background in environmental journalism, science communications and are all Florida natives and so we hatched a plan to launch this project that we called the Marjorie. The Marjorie is a tribute to three of Florida's famous Marjories. Marjorie Kinnan Rawlings who was an author and journalist. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas who was an advocate and conservationist and Marjorie Harris Carr, who was also a conservationist and advocate. So Florida has this rich tradition of activism and advocacy led by women. And so the Marjorie is in part a nod to to that legacy and also unites our interest as environmental journalists in telling the stories and carving out a platform and outlet for these kinds of stories that we didn't see, you know, three years ago being told on a large scale. So we started this at this idea, you know, we wanted to contribute these in-depth stories about Florida's environment. And we didn't know exactly where we were going with that at the time. Now we are a nonprofit and we focus on series about in-depth issues, investigative and contextual reporting uh, about Florida's environment. And uh, so we have a really regional focus and it's been cool because there've been a lot of other outlets like us popping up in other regions across the United States. And so we've been sort of part of this movement without even knowing it, this nonprofit journalism. So how often, how often do you publish? So we publish about four issues a year in terms of our reporting, but then we also have contributor series. So we have contributions from other writers and um, we publish those intermittently as well. So we're definitely not a breaking news organization. We try to to focus on more in-depth investigative and contextual stories and we all have like full-time jobs as well. So this is this is you know extracurricular passion project that is also a full-time job kind of. I'm curious by what you mean when you say environment because it's certainly a very broad definition and it certainly jumped out at me when I went to your site that you extended the definition pretty wide. We purposefully kept that term broad. Of course, there are the things that I think we all think about when we think about the word environment, you know, having to do with natural resources, agriculture, rural spaces, but we kept that broad because environment is such an intersectional term, if you will. It unites questions of social justice and racial inequity, economics. I mean, you name it, you can kind of connect everything to the environment. And that's one of the reasons that we use that in this way and keep our net pretty wide. I think if you look back at our at our archives. I mean, we have stories ranging from all kinds of regions and all kinds of, you know, thematic topical points. 
so let's give a few examples of those and we'll talk about one or two. Some examples of recent stories on the site. A student in Florida wrote about the transition of Samford from rural to suburban and the impact that that had both on the environment and her. There was a four part series related to racial justice about the University of Florida using prison labor to run their agricultural research farms. You had an a article on Amendment 4, a series on Amendment 4 in Florida and the quest to get voting rights restored to convicted felons. Another piece about sexual harassment and discrimination in herpetology, which is the study of reptiles and amphibians, and also a, a piece on inclusivity in the field of geology. A story about a wounded panther who became very popular at the Naples Zoo and a series of first person accounts called Dispatches from a Sinking State. And this is where I want to go. In January, he ran a story called Diary from a Florida Bathroom about human tree frogs that showed up in toilets. It was written by someone who worked at a zoo and was trained in frog identification. What can you tell us about that piece? I love that you picked that one. <laughs> and it's a great story. So the story starts with Jade Salamone waking up and she uses the toilet in her downstairs bathroom. And as she's sitting there, she feels this slimy nudge on her thigh, which is a little horrifying for her. So then she, you know, looks down to see what it is. And inside her toilet is a Cuban tree frog, which is one of the invasive frog species that has become a really significant issue in Florida. So Jade has a really unique perspective because she is the co-coordinator for Gainesville Frog Watch USA at the Santa Fe College chapter and she's also works at the Santa Fe College Teaching Zoo. So she knows about animals, she knows about Florida, she specifically knows about frogs and toads. So she uses this article as a way to walk through what's at stake for native frogs and for the natural environment and for people living in the state as these invasive frog and toad species like the Cuban tree frog become more prolific. And so she advocates for killing these frogs and she describes a humane way to do it. But she also acknowledges that it's a really difficult thing to do, you know, that it is painful and that they are fascinating creatures and that ending their lives can be really difficult. But she points out that by taking out these invasive frogs one at a time, you're advocating for the native frogs who those invasives are displacing. So it's a story with a lot of uh, layers to it. Now, I purposely picked that one because I wanted to go with something that was accessible to a broader audience. You do things that are certainly much more specific and much more serious. Is there one that you would like to spotlight either among the ones that I read through or uh, one that I didn't. One of the things that I love about our Dispatches series is that you can have stories like Jade's that seem kind of fun, but then get at this deeper issue that's tied to climate change and invasive species. On, I would say on the other end of that spectrum within Dispatches is a, an essay called Farewell Sanibel by a Gainesville-based author and educator named Jessie Wilson, wherein she thinks about the climate change data impacting the, or the forecast for her hometown of Sanibel Island and goes through this very personal process of saying goodbye to that place, knowing what the sea level rise predictions are. And so it is tied to this idea of climate grief and eco grief that we've heard. I mean, I think every pitch we get ties into this idea of loss and contending with what it means to belong and what home means and thinking about the future generations. So I would just touch on that one because it is kind of this more serious emotional arc of our Dispatches series. Yeah, that's a great one to point out. Hannah, and is I there do... one you want to salute? Sure. And I just wanted to note too that, so Dispatches is a series that we received a grant from the Society of Environmental Journalists to actually bring in people whose voices are not commonly heard into, into this discussion. So we're actually going to be publishing a series of six more articles in April from people all over the state. And we're really excited. There's some really cool stories. So keep an eye out for that. Yeah, I would love to salute one of our other stories just because it, it marked a real turning point for us. The series is called A Sugarcane Boiling Point. 
and we published this issue in 2019. And it's about pre-harvest burns during sugarcane farming in South Florida. So just a little background for your listeners in case they don't know much about sugarcane farming. Sugarcane is a tall grass and it grows up to 12 feet high. And as the stalk shoots up, dead leaves slough off and new green leaves emerge at the top. And it's a really common part of farming to set those sugarcane fields on fire. Um, they call them pre-harvest burns to dispose of those dead leaves that accumulate around the stalk of the plant. And that is supposed to you know, make it easier to harvest in some farmers' opinions. However, some Glades area residents, so that's one of the areas where the farming takes place, have questioned the safety of using these burns as a standard in cane farming because there's all of this air pollution that comes from setting fields on fire. And a lot of times these fields are located right next to people's houses, they're next to schools, you know, they're in areas where that air pollution can easily affect communities. And in other regions, researchers have linked these pre-harvest burns to serious health impacts like respiratory issues. So we took a look at this issue by talking to community members who believe the burns are a health crisis, a public health crisis, but then others who think there's no way to safely harvest sugarcane without using the burns. And what we did is we looked at the shared cultural history of both sides. So we tried to find some common ground between these people who seem to have opposing sides and you know, we have some really interesting characters and people that we met. So one character was Akina Phillips. And as a child, Akina loved cane season. She talks about, you know, different ways they would eat it. They would put salt and pepper just straight on the cane right after they harvested it. And so it is a huge part of her identity. It, but it wasn't until she became a, an adult that she began to see a connection between these pre-harvest burns and the compromised health of her friends community and family. She told us a story about how, you know, it was common for her to shout to her childhood friends, like, don't forget your inhalers when they're going outside to play. And she thought that that was normal. And when she got older, her, her own family was affected. She saw her grandson after he was born, uh, he was born during cane season and he had respiratory issues, especially when he was outside. So now Kina has become an activist with the Sierra Club and we uh, got to interview her for this issue. On the other side, we met Amy Perry. And just like Kina, Amy is a fifth generation sugarcane farmer living in Moorhaven, which is a town southwest of Lake Okeechobee. Her family has about 15,000 acres that they farm. And she told these stories about, you know, growing up on the farm, falling asleep on the tractor when she was going down for her afternoon nap. But she insists that the, the burns are cleaner and safer for the workers in the field there. So, you know, as I was saying before, we focused on finding common ground between these two opposing sides, looking at the cultural connections that they have. And we believe that, you know, if we can do that in our storytelling, if we can find ways to show where, you know, people have shared values, then it's kind of paving a way for people to understand each other better, to find a way to communicate with one another, to, to know that they can work together to find solutions. And this idea has seemed to really resonate with our readers, people connected with this issue, and we won a couple of awards for it. And it's really like a salute. I think it was our first real solutions journalism piece without even really intending it to be. It just sort of happened that way. And one thing that you note about environmental reporting that I saw on the site is that it crosses party lines. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah, Florida is such a complicated place. It's the butt of national jokes a lot, which like much to the fury of a lot of us who live here. But one of the things that we all talked about as a team after the presidential election is, is the election returns. So our, our state voted overwhelmingly for Donald Trump, voted in, you know, we have a Republican governor. So on these kind of statewide and national issues, there's this red, this kind of, what is the word I'm trying to look for? We're a red state in a lot of ways. But when you start to look at local initiative, uh, initiatives and local measures that towns and municipalities and counties passed, there are so many inconsistencies with that kind of red line party ticket. 
a a town in Florida passed a rights of nature bill. We saw a lot of clean water initiatives passed, a lot of things that just kind of don't measure up. So that kind of fuels our reporting, that guides the way we look at things. It's never a black and white issue. It's always complicated. It's always regionally dependent. And oftentimes the environment is the one thing that people agree on. And so that's something that comes up time and time again in the stories that we tell and in just the Floridian community, I think. While we're talking politics, I want to reference one other story before we move along. Rebecca Burton, who you mentioned earlier, your other partner, did a piece on the frustration that kids have with political leaders when it comes to the environment, which connects to Greta Thunberg, who we've certainly become familiar with. Can you give us a, a brief uh, summary of that one? Sure. So we did a series called Treading Water, and it was about climate change in Florida and specifically a, a group of young activists who were suing the state of Florida, trying to have better climate action and some things actually happening in the state to, you know, help mitigate issues that are happening because of climate change. And we did, a, you know, we each did a different kind of side of that story. I think Becca's story focused specifically on this group of activists. And it was really powerful. We found that there's this issue of eco grief that's happening alongside climate change, which you know our dispatches series speaks to as well. But growing up as a young person in this generation, knowing that climate change is looming is this very terrifying thing for some of these young activists. And becoming involved in activism has almost been like therapy for some of them uh, because it's a way that they can do something and feel like they're contributing. So we, that was part of what this, this story focused on. And it was just really inspiring to hear from these, I want to call them kids, but they're like so mature and advanced. It's ridiculous. And inspiring to like, you know, well, why, what, why aren't we doing more? <laughs> All right. So who, who exactly is your audience? We are a woman owned organization and we specifically highlight and publish women, but our content is relevant to anyone. I mean, our, our reporting series are issues that anyone who cares about Florida, Florida's environment, Florida's social justice issues, it would be relevant to them. So far, you know, so I would say that's, we're targeting anyone who cares about Florida, you know, and we particularly resonate with women who have, you know, connections to Florida lands or, you know, who, who have lived here or used to live here or, you know, our advocates in some way. Is that the reason for the hashtag, uh, re the Reclaiming Florida Women theme? That is definitely part of it. When we started the Marjorie, we wanted to, you know, come up with something to distill what our mission was. And we decided Reclaim the hashtag Florida Woman was a good place to start because I'm sure you have seen, you know, all the Florida man stories that have been out uh, in internationally, you know, and that coverage is quite sensational. And we often talk about how they are, you know, those stories are designed to be headline grabbing stories, but they rely on harmful stereotypes about people of our state. And a lot of times those stories feel like cheap shots to us. They're often classist, they're racist and insensitive to mental illness, financial struggles, substance abuse. And so we wanted to take a hard line with stories like that and show that this is not the Florida that we know. These are not the Florida people that, you know, we feel should be highlighted internationally. And so we wanted to flood that hashtag with stories of Florida women that were protecting the state. And we wrote a editorial about this a couple of years back called uh, Florida Woman Fights Back, which talks more about that. Last thing before we move to the advice uh, portion of the episode, what do you do in your day to day jobs? I am a PhD student at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. I'm a second year in the Department of American Studies. So being a student is my full, full-time job. I'm a research assistant at the Southern Oral History Program, which is part of the Center for the Study of the American South at UNC Chapel Hill, which I'm happy to be there. It builds into my own personal work and my personal interests, and it's just a really vibrant community of scholars and thinkers and creators. So that's, 
that's my current full-time job. Right now I have a couple jobs on top of the Marjorie. So I teach environmental science to undergraduate students at the University of Florida. And I'm also working with the Florida Department of Environmental Protection and the University of Florida writing the management plan for the new Nature Coast Aquatic Preserve, which is the first aquatic preserve created in the state in more than 30 years. We're expanding the advice segment for the show. Our podcast intern, Emmy Lederman, was not able to be with us today, but she shared the following questions. How do you engage new audiences in a topic that they may not have previously been interested in? That's a great question. And that is like an essential question for journalists, right? We are really focused on people at the Marjorie. Like we really want to show the human side of these more complex environmental issues. So something we like to do is introduce a character early on in the story, someone that the reader can have a human connection with and then can guide them through the story as one perspective. Often we'll have multiple characters um, to show various perspectives, but it helps to have somebody to start with. And I think it's, it's really like an empathy thing. You know, if you can get people to relate, then they're, they're more willing to understand and to wrap their head around an idea. What do you wish you knew about journalism when you started working? The amount of rejection that you will get, you just have to not take to heart. Uh, Rejection does not reflect your shortcomings. It reflects, you know, just the wrong publication or the wrong time, but it's, it's not a personal failure. What gaps in coverage should students of my generation work to fill? Um, Are there any distinct barriers to overcome in education? Yeah, I think, you know, working the environmental side of whatever story into their, their reporting is pretty crucial. There's always an environmental connection and it's difficult. You know, a lot of publications don't have enough funding to have like a solely dedicated environmental reporter. So that's one thing I would say is just making sure you're thinking about the context in terms of the environment. And the other thing that comes to my mind is this idea of focusing on common ground rather than emphasizing conflict. Obviously, journalists, their job is to hold people accountable. And so you don't want to, you know, gloss over things that have been, I don't know, misdeeds and irresponsibility. But when you can, showing people how they relate you know, how they have things in common can be really helpful in moving discussions forward between groups of people. And I think that journalists have an ability there to promote those discussions. And it's something that's really needed right now. There's a lot of divisiveness, as I'm sure I don't need to explain to your listeners. Everyone's feeling it, right? And so it's part of, it's another thing is people see journalists as as part of that, as part of, you know, building this divide. But I don't think that journalists necessarily are. And I think that, you know, it it would take some just very small steps to show that actually journalists are part of the solution, you know, on showing how, you know, you can bring these conversations from different sides together. I think listening to your, the community of your beat and thinking about what it is that they are, what do you hear from them? Instead of imposing an idea about what you should be covering or what expectations you think you should have in the case where you're feeling like a fish out of water, listening to the folks that you're covering. Because you might get a job as an environmental reporter and your background is in, you know, educational reporting, But you'll see that those skills of listening and distilling information that you are hearing from your community groups and your community narrators will will get you there. If you're doing your job and listening, (laughs) I mean, being community focused and community forward is something that really guides us. We come in sometimes with ideas that we think we want to cover. And when we start the reporting process, we realize that the story is actually something completely different, that the tension is something completely different. And just being open to that process of revision along the way and being willing to to learn and, and go with the flow will definitely serve you in those circumstances. Okay, last question. We always ask this to close the show for each of you. Is there a journalism organization that you're not affiliated with that you would like to salute? I mean, I feel like I really want to salute Lindsay Gilpin at Southerly, which thank you to Anna for introducing us to Lindsay. 
she we we worked with Southerly on one of our series, The Fruits of Their Labor. So, you know, we do have some affiliation with them in that regard. But she if they're they're similar to us in that they focus on environmental and social justice issues in the South, but she covers the South. And she's a rock star who has built this publication focusing on local stories you know, avoiding that parachute journalism mentality. And she does it over a much broader region than we cover. And her team and her are doing an amazing job. So I definitely would like to salute Lindsay. I mean, I think Hannah took my answer. We're just, Hannah mentioned earlier in the interview that we, I think this year, we kind of looked back and realized that we were coming up alongside other similar adjacent projects, Southerly being one of them who has just, I mean, ex- you know, exploded into this crucial journalistic presence in the, in the South, but also nationally. Other organizations like Southerly are, are Scalawag. I don't know if you're familiar with Scalawag. Yep, they've been shouted out a couple of times. Cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I would just reiterate both of those, I think. They are in this time when we're seeing so many local newspapers and local journalism outlets just fold and and communities kind of be left without those information anchors. We're also seeing this this counterforce of you know, people on the ground in these places trying to figure out how to fill those gaps and to how, how to reestablish these networks. So anytime that we can support those folks, you know, we definitely do. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mark. Thank you so much. The Marjorie is dedicated to bringing people together in the name of protecting Florida's lands, waters, animals, and people. They invite you to join their community of environmental leaders by engaging with them and participating in the conversation. The story of Florida's environment is sometimes tragic, sometimes triumphant. Wherever we go from here, the Marjorie will be there too, documenting the process and missteps and offering insight. To learn more, go to themarjorie.org. If you're interested in learning more about environmental journalism, the Marjorie posts links to prominent people you should follow and the stories that they share. I'll note three of them. Cynthia Barnett, a longtime journalist who teaches environmental journalism at the University of Florida. She's an expert on water issues and the changing climate. Danny Washington, the first black woman to host a science TV show in the United States. Her passion is ocean education. She has a nonprofit that teaches kids about marine conservation. She hosts the show Exploration Station. And Jenny Steltovich, a environmental journalist, both a writer and radio reporter for WLRN, a public radio and TV station in South Florida. She focuses on pressing issues that affect Floridians. The Journalism Salute is dedicated to the memory of Dr. Robert Cole, who ran the journalism department at Trenton State College, the College of New Jersey, for more than 30 years. Thank you for listening to the Journalism Salute. Please let us know what you think of the show. You can find us on Twitter at JournalismPod, and you can email us at JournalismSalute at gmail.com.